morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the second week of Epiphany. Thank you for joining me today. Um, our readings for today will be using Psalm number, I believe it's 65. 65, we'll be reading from Isaiah, uh, finishing chapter 44 and moving into chapter 45. And we'll move into Ephesians chapter 5. As always, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Um, we can always use God's help to maintain our focus, so let's pray that he would help us do that. Please pray with me. Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Psalm 65. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be performed in Jerusalem. To you that hear prayer shall all flesh come because of their transgressions. Our sins are stronger than we are, but you will blot them out. Happy are they whom you choose and draw to your courts to dwell there. They will be satisfied by the beauty of your house, by the holiness of your temple. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. You make fast the mountains by your power, they are girded about with might. You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at your marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dusk to sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. Let us pray. Lord God, joy marks your presence. Beauty, abundance, and peace are the tokens of your work in all creation. Work also in our lives, that by these signs we may see the splendor of your love and may praise you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 44, and we'll begin at verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who stretched out the heavens alone, who spread out the earth, who was with me, who frustrates the omens of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, 
she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Who says to the deep, Be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built. And of the temple, Your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and ungird the loins of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut asunder the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who called you by your name, for the sake of my servant Jacob, and Israel my chosen. I call you by your name, I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I gird you, though you do not know me that men may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I am the Lord who do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Our, pardon me. Our second reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, and we will begin at verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But fornication and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is fitting among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor silly talk, nor levity which are not fitting, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator, or impure man, or one who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not associate with them, for once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> in many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, 
to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Whenever we try to face life with nothing but the strength that is ours, show us, O God, how poor it is. Then share with us thine own down the ways of thy steady purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness. O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away, every day will I praise you and praise your name forever and ever. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. <clears throat> o Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> okay. So, how are you feeling about these lessons today? <laughs> As I read these, all I could think was, with God there are no coincidences. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is Isaiah. Isaiah is talking about God as the Redeemer of the people. Who formed you from the womb. God has known us from that very first spark of conception. Before that. I am the Lord. The first two words out of his mouth are who he is. I am. Right? Yehovah. I am who I am. I am the Lord. Right? I am your king. I have authority over you. I am the Lord who made all things. 
everything you can see and touch and smell and taste. God made it. Who stretched out the heavens alone, who spread out the earth. Was anybody with me? Hmm? And then this next section, who, who frustrates the omens of liars. You know? Someone says, I picture when he says that, um, those those street prophets in the big cities that walk around carrying those signs, the end is near, the end is near. And they've been saying that for 150 years, 200 years. Who makes fools of diviners? People who try to predict the future without God's prophecy, without the gift of God's prophecy. Um, and some who do so in the name of God, like that there was a pastor, and I'm sorry, his name escapes me. And he said, well, the earth will, the earth will be destroyed by God on May 7th, I don't know what it was, May 7th, May 27th, something, of 2012. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it was, and he had done this before. And his parishioners were convinced that he was correct. And everybody sold everything they had. They sold their houses. They sold their retirement. They cashed in their, their retirement plans. Uh, and it just it woke up the next day and everything was fine. Or as fine as this fallen world can be. I am the Lord who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish. Hmm. How many people have we seen in history who thought they had everything figured out and then someone came along and proved them wrong people were convinced that the sun went around the earth that the earth was the center of everything and lo and behold that wasn't the case that wasn't the case but they believed it to be true hmm. who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers in other words those who are faithful will be proven because God will back them. Hmm. Who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Okay, so what does that mean? God allowed his wrath to be felt by his own people. Why? They were his people, but they turned their backs on him. So he let them feel his wrath. He let them feel what it's like to live without God. And what happened? They got conquered. And that's where he goes next. And the Lord who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. There had been droughts and famines. I'm the Lord who says of Cyrus, Cyrus was not one of God's people. He was an enemy king. And God let him conquer Israel. But God says of him, he is my shepherd. So he's going to round up God's sheep. And he shall fulfill all my purpose. Right? He will let the people feel him. And then, what was the first thing? They will be redeemed. Right? I am the Lord your Redeemer. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So... The temple was destroyed, and it was rebuilt. Okay? And then he talks to, he says to his anointed, Cyrus, right? <coughs> what is anointed? Excuse me. To be set apart for something special. Whose right hand I have grasped. So God grabbed Cyrus to subdue nations before him, to ungird the loins of kings. Okay, so I ask you, was Cyrus a good man? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. He didn't live according to God's law. He wasn't what the Jews would have called righteous. Certainly not slaughtering Jews as he would have when he conquered Israel. But he subdued nations, which was God's purpose. To open doors before him that gates may not be closed. And then this next part's in quotes. These are exact words that God spoke to Cyrus. I will go before you and level the mountains. 
I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut asunder the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. So God is going to take away all the obstacles in front of Cyrus so he can just plow through these other countries and conquer them easily. And he will then gain their treasures. For that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. So even this non-Hebrew king will know that the Hebrew, the Hebrew God, or the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the one who gave him these victories. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. So, what is a surname, right? My, my surname is Cook. That is the family name that is passed down through my father and his father and his father. It is the legacy, okay? God has given, Yahweh, Yahweh has given Israel its surname. That is their legacy, given to, handed down through their fathers and their fathers' fathers, right? That is their legacy, given to them by the God who created them, who saved them from Egypt, and now who will save them from Cyrus. Though you do not know me, see, this doesn't happen within one person's lifetime. This that the prophet Isaiah is talking about happened over several generations. So while the earlier generations may have known God in the teaching, they turned away from God, and their children and their children's children were not raised in the faith. See? They turned away from God's ways. So these grandchildren, these third or fourth generation young youngsters who are Israelite by name, but not by faith. They don't know God. And so he says, again, I am the Lord. And there is no other. Not for you. Not as far as you're concerned, Israel. Not for you, Jacob. Besides me, there is no God. He repeats that. I gird you though you do not know me. To gird up your loins means to pick everything up and get ready to run. I gird you, though you do not know me, that men may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. As far as you can see, east to west. Everywhere you can see, everyone will know I am the only God. I am the Lord and there is no other. He starts and ends that paragraph with the same exact words. I am the Lord and there is no other. I am the Lord and there is no other. It's bookended. I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. That's W-E-A-L, wheel. I am the Lord who do all these things. God is not only omniscient, mean, meaning that he knows all, he is omnipotent, meaning that he is almighty, all-powerful. He created everything, including the people. And there's a lot there about how he uses an enemy king to do his bidding. Now, don't think for a second that I'm not thinking deeply about what that means on a day like today, on Inauguration Day. Hmm. We should all be thinking about that. With God, there are no coincidences either. Let's get into Ephesians chapter 5. Be imitators of God, Paul says. Remember, he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. Be, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. God loves us. We are beloved. We are his children. And walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, 
a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, right? So his sacrifice to God was the atonement for the sins of the whole world. And that is a fragrant offering to God. All right. But fornication and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. You shouldn't even be accused of it, in other words. None of you. As is fitting among saints. Everyone in this church, Paul says, is considered a saint as a beloved child of God. Let there be no filthiness or silly talk or levity which are not fitting. What comes out of your mouth? Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Begin with thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure man or one who is covetous, and then there's parentheses, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay, so what's he saying there? He's saying hold each other accountable, right? And what does that say about the idea that we are not supposed to judge? Okay, when you hear that, oh, we're not, we're not supposed to judge. See, there's a problem with that. That's taking a command out of context. See, I would say this sentence right here tells us that we are supposed to judge. What Paul says in other places is that just know that the measure with which you judge, you too will be judged. So if you go around telling people that they're not being honest, you better be honest in everything you do. Because if you're not, you will be the ultimate hypocrite. That is what Paul is saying. We are to make sure, be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure man or one who is covetous that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay, so if you know one who is one of those things, you need to call them to account, right? The kingdom of God is not a place for people like that. They need to confess their sin, right? And now here's the next, this, then he moves into the next part. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. All right. I, I, I don't know how to do this without being controversial. So I'm going to pick, I guess, an easy topic. Abortion. Okay. I don't understand. I don't understand how Christians can get the idea that abortion is okay. Just, you know, my body, my choice. Now, I spent a lot of time as a pro-choice person in my adult life. And as I came into this calling and began to really read the Bible, it became very clear to me that God is pro-life. The Bible is explicitly pro-life. Now, I am not going to say that it is an easy choice. I, I would not envy any family that had to talk about these things, that there are certainly some circumstances that it just seems to some families the only choice. But to use abortion as contraception, um, as a matter of convenience, as... You know, these women who just brag about how many abortions they've had. You cannot, you cannot defend that biblically. You can't. It's, it's just not doable. There's no way to find scripture to, to tell anyone that that's okay in God's eyes. It's just not possible. And there are, I've heard pastors I have heard bishops in other denominations who have celebrated this and prayed for the blessing of abortion clinics. And I just, I don't, I don't get it. These, these are the sons and daughters of disobedience. This is one example. 
Am I a son of disobedience? It's very possible. I am a sinner too. I, I'm not claiming to be high and mighty and more righteous, but this was revealed to me by someone who very much surprised me because he comes from the liberal side of Lutheranism. And he said to me without any hesitation, if you are a Christian, you are pro-life. Period. His words, not mine. It is because of these empty words, things that we profess but don't believe, that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them. Wow. So what is Paul saying here? This is one of those times where we have to ask, is this only for the church at Ephesus? Or is this a timeless bit of wisdom that Paul is sharing that can be applied everywhere? I think that's something that has to be discerned, and we're not going to do it tonight. Today. I, Ephesus was faced with a lot of pagan influence, okay? And a lot of new Christians were very tempted to continue in some of their pagan tradition as they were trying to become Christians. And those two things don't mix. A lot of pagan religions, they didn't care if you worshipped Zeus and Apollo and Poseidon and Athena. They, they didn't care. Um, I am the Lord, there is no other. There's not room for that in Christianity. So do not associate them with them, Paul says. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. They have converted from their pagan ways and have become followers of Jesus Christ. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. You were darkness, now you're light. Walk that way. First thing I think of when I hear that is, you talk the talk, do you walk the walk? How do you walk? Do you live out your faith? <clears throat> For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. In other words, if you're walking the walk, your life will bear fruit that is good and right and true. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So how do you do that? By learning his law, by reading his word and studying it, by figuring out what it is that God has said to us that he wants for us, but also from us, but mostly what God wants for us. That's how you learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Expose the unfruitful works of darkness. You could say I did that in my explanation of abortion just now. Okay, There are Christians, Christian pastors, who will say abortion is okay and it's good that we allow women to have this freedom because God likes freedom <sighs> boy we really have to that's such a stretch um, that's not a faithful interpretation of the biblical understanding of those concepts when you hear that put like that. So take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is a shame even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. What is exposed? Huh? What is exposed? Typically, things that are not good and right and true are not done in the light. Things that are sneaky and shady are done in darkness, are done with the door closed, are done with the lights out, right? Um, what is it we've heard lately? One of the... Uh, I, won't, I won't describe the context, but... We've, we've heard it said that nothing good happens after midnight, so stay indoors. 
Um, yeah, there's something to be said for that. I don't know that I've ever heard many stories that were happy stories with good endings that took place after midnight, but... When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Hmm. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Now, I have to think about... I can't... I guess I should say I can't help but think about the physics of light in that comment, right? What, what is it that you see? Okay? What you're seeing is light that is transmitted through a camera, but when you have to look at my face, and I'm sorry I don't have a better um, subject <laughs> for you to do this with, when you look at my face, what you're seeing is light bouncing off of me. You know, It's bouncing off of my face into the camera. Um, my black shirt doesn't reflect as much light as my white collar does. White reflects all the colors. Black doesn't reflect many at all. In fact, it absorbs more than it reflects. Um, but when, when we turn the lights on, right, if I, if I were to turn all the lights off, I can't do it without stepping off camera, but if we were to turn all the lights off, you wouldn't see anything because there's no light being bounced off of my face, my body, the wall, the curtain, the plaque behind me. So when we put me in the light, then I reflect that light. Okay. What kind of light are we reflecting? Now, we as Christians should be reflecting the light of Christ. That is our call. Therefore it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Hmm. Darkness, sleep. So when they were walking in darkness, they didn't know what God had done for them. They didn't know what Christ had done for them. So... So you arise from, from the dead of not knowing, not knowing the faith, not knowing what Christ has done for you, not knowing God's love and redemption and grace and mercy. Christ then will give you light as you get to know him, as you learn his ways, as you learn what is pleasing to God. Right? When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. I'm stuck on that. I guess I'm still absorbing it. Certainly something there. Yeah. They say that um, light is the great um, disinfectant. Right? It's the great disinfectant. What happens when you, when you turn lights on somewhere that there hasn't been any light in a long time? Well, in the south, the cockroaches, I'm sorry, the the water bugs go running, right? Right? All the all the cockroaches scatter. And then you can see where all the mess was and you can clean it up. Um yeah. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Expose them. All right. I went over time. I'm sorry. There's lots to think about there. Lots and lots and lots to think about. So I hope you will. I hope you'll pray about it. And I hope you'll pray for our country today because I'm quite certain we need it. But let's pray right now together, shall we? <clears throat> Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, that concludes our matins for today. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for spending time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day He's given to you. Uh, we will do this again tomorrow. And um, until then, I would ask you to continue to be in prayer. I think we need to be in prayer more now 
than at any other time I can remember. Um, it's going to be a tough time for a while. So I hope you will join me in praying for our country and our leadership and, and our, our population. And let's hope that God uh, will put his hand on the shoulders of a few people who really could use his guidance and wisdom. All right. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And until we can be together again, may God bless and keep you.